Thank you, Josh. Hi, everybody. How are we? We good? Okay. We ready to go? All right. Hey, it's good to see you. Uh, if we have not met, I am Brian, like Josh said. Really good to be with you. Excited to get to share some of God's word with you this morning. We are in part five of a series called Living Into the Kingdom. And what we've been doing in this series is we have been talking about this beautiful, awesome reality called the kingdom of God. And what we've learned in this series is that the kingdom of God is not a physical location, but that rather the kingdom is any, anywhere where God is ruling and reigning. And we've also learned that the kingdom of God is something that you and I, we can participate in that we can join God in his work in the world. We can participate in his kingdom. We've also learned that as we live in this world, we're living in what has been called the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God. That on the one hand, when Jesus came for the first time, he inaugurated the kingdom. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. So the kingdom is a present reality that we can live into today. It is now. But we also know that the kingdom is not yet, that we have not yet experienced the kingdom in its fullness. We still live in a broken world where there's pain and difficulty and challenges. And a day will come when Jesus will come and make all things new and will experience the kingdom in its fullness. We live in the now and the not yet. But once again, we've learned in this series, and this is so important, that the kingdom is not just something that's coming later. We can participate in it today. So I missed this last weekend. I was able to listen on podcasts, but I, I missed this last weekend because I was out of town. I was in Kalispell, Montana, where I, yeah, they have people there, where I had, I had the wonderful honor of presiding over my grandfather's memorial service. My grandfather was a wonderful man. He'd lived a long life, and, and, he, and he and my grandmother lived in Kalispell for 50 years. It's a very special place for our family. So I was up there and, and, and I was so honored that my dad and all of his siblings would, would, would invite me to preside over the service. So I was thinking and praying about, okay, what do I want to talk about in my little portion of the service, in addition to, of course, talking about my grandfather and his life. I said, how do I, how do I want to connect this back to the Lord? Because I, and even in talking to my family and kind of my grandfather's friends, like maybe your family's like this, like there's a range of sort of interest in spiritual things, right? And if I'm being honest, the range is mostly at the low end, right? So I'm like, but I want to talk about, I want to talk about God in the midst of kind of what we're, we're celebrating today. So I was thinking and praying about what am I going to share with my family and, and, and their friends. And uh, the story that came to mind was a story that maybe you're familiar with if you're a, if you're a Bible person, you're familiar with the scriptures, but it's the story of the rich young ruler. It's found three different places in the Gospels. And what happens in that story is this guy comes to Jesus, and as the title would lead you to believe, he is rich, he is young, and he is a ruler. So he's got a lot going for him in his life, right? And he comes to Jesus, and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what I told my family, and what I want to tell you today, is that within the Christian tradition, I think so often we talk about Christianity like it's just about believing the right things so that you can go to heaven when you die. And is heaven part of our faith? Of course it is. But that is an incorrect view of the sacredness of this life. That in fact, a Christian worldview recognizes that this life is sacred, that this life is beautiful, and that our life is not just about believing the right things so that we can go to heaven, it's about partnering with God so that we can bring a little bit of heaven to earth. And what I said to my family was I said, when this man was talking to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He wasn't asking, how do I go to heaven when I die? That's not what he was asking. What he was saying was he was saying, listen, Jesus, I've got all of this stuff that should make me happy. I'm, after all, a rich young ruler, in case you didn't notice. And yet I feel this emptiness in me. I have everything that should make me feel fulfilled. Maybe you can relate to this a little bit. I have everything that should make me feel fulfilled, and yet I'm experiencing this emptiness. And as I look to you, Jesus, and I look at the way that you live, and I look at what you teach, and I look at the miracles that you do, and I look at sort of your approach, I see something that I'm missing. How do I live that life? 
Pastor Lance rightly told us at the start of this series that eternal life is not just about duration, it is about quality. And that eternal life begins now. And see, as we're in this series, living into the kingdom, participation in the kingdom of God starts now. Does it go on into eternity? Yeah, but it's something for us today. And Pastor Lance spent the first three weeks of this series talking about what is the kingdom. And then last week, Pastor Parnell kind of transitioned us into the, the, what the remainder of the series is going to be about, where we're going to spend the remainder of this series talking about these incredible stories that Jesus told to help us understand the kingdom. These stories are called parables, and they're, again, they're just stories that Jesus would tell using this language, the kingdom of God is like. And they're found all throughout the Gospels. And I love these stories. They're just incredible to me. They're like, they remind me, of like, if you hold, like, a, a precious stone or something or a, a diamond or something like that. I mean, not that I've held a diamond this big, but you get the idea. And that if you, every time you turn it, sort of the light hits it a little differently and maybe you can notice something different that you didn't see before. That, to me, is how the parables work. There is, there is sort of surface level meanings to a lot of them, but they're so rich and deep and nuanced and there's so much for us to understand that the more you look at them, the more you explore them, the more that you learn. And we can read these stories and we can say, okay, is there some sort of theological lesson here? Is there some sort of social lesson here? Is there some sort of economic lesson here? Is this something about how I'm supposed to love my neighbor? Is this something for today or is this something for the future? And more often than not, if you look hard enough, you find that the answer to that question is yes, right? That the parables speak to all of these things and that is part of what makes them so beautiful. And we're going to look at two parables today, and here's sort of the overarching big idea that I want to make sure is communicated and that we're going to see in these stories. The overarching big idea is this, that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of generosity. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of generosity. Put differently, God is radically generous. God is radically generous. God gives and God loves, and God gives and God loves, and God gives and God loves, and that is just who he is. And I don't know what your conception of God is. Maybe you think that God is disappointed in you. Maybe you think that God is waiting for you to screw up. Maybe you think that God is withholding from you because he's stingy or something like that. I need you to know God is generous, and he's loving. That God is radically generous. And here's what he does. He invites us to live our lives with the knowledge that everything we have is a gift from him. That everything we have is a gift from him. In the good things, we can see God get God's gifts. In the pain, even there, there are gifts to be seen. And I just believe, and I've seen just the benefit of this in my own life, I just believe that there is such grace to be found when we recognize that everything we have is a gift from God, right? When we recognize everything we have is a gift from God. I mean, just think about this way. I mean, I live in the real world just like you do. I, I deal with this stuff. Like, we get so locked up in bitterness, right? How do we find our way out of bitterness? I think a big part of it is recognizing that everything is a gift, right? Or, or I don't know about how, many, how many of you, like me, have the spiritual gift of cynicism, right? Some of you are like, that's not a spiritual gift. It's not, you're right, but I've still got it. What's the way out of cynicism? It's the recognition that everything's a gift. What's the way out of, of a life spent complaining about everything we don't have and looking at other people and everything that they do have and thinking, oh, if I just had more, if this situation was different, if I could just orchestrate things a different way, if everyone would just listen to me, da 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 da, da. What's the way out of that mindset? It's the recognition that everything is a gift. See, so many of us, we live our lives thinking that we need more. We think we, li we live our lives thinking that we need more gifts. <laughs> when I think what we really need is the recognition that everything is a gift. What's really going to make us happy? What's going to make us fulfilled? Is it, is it more? I don't, I don't think that's going to do it. But I think there is fulfillment to be found in, in, in recognizing that everything is a gift. I think there's fulfillment to be found in recognizing that God has been radically generous with us. I came across this beautiful quote from a guy by the name of Brennan Manning this week, and I'd seen it before, and it's just so good. He says, define yourself radically as one beloved by God. 
define yourself radically. What defines you? What, what defines the way you think about what God thinks about you? Define yourself radically as one beloved by God. This is the true self. Every other identity is an illusion. What identities are you carrying with you? Is it an identity that tells you you're radically loved by God? Because if it's not, it's an illusion. You're radically loved by God, and God is radically generous. And there's such beauty to be found in the realization that, that, that everything is a gift, that everything is grace. Even in the, even in the, the pain, there is, there is grace. In fact, just, just the other day, I was looking through my own Instagram feed. And I don't mean the feeds of people I follow. I mean my own feed. So I don't know if that's just poor time management or narcissism or both. But I'm looking at all of these things that moments from my life in the last year that I, I, I had decided were interesting enough to share with the world. And I'm looking, and just like you, I've got hard stuff and challenges and stress and all this, but we all know we don't share that stuff on social media. <laughs> so I'm looking at these things and just these pictures and these memories. I'm like, ah, oh, it's a gift. Oh, what, what great, what, what a gift to be able to have these moments. I think there's beauty in recognizing that everything's a gift, that God has been extremely generous with us. Because here's the deal, Here, here's a big reason why recognizing God's generosity is so important. Because when we are the recipient of generosity, it transforms us, does it not, right? I, I think about something as silly as like, this is something that happens way too often in my life, where maybe I'm driving, and I know I need to get into this lane. But for reasons that I cannot explain, I have failed to do that at the proper time. So now we've got a line of cars stacked up in this lane and there's no room for me to get in. And now I'm driving slowly in this lane, making friends with the people behind me, trying to get in. And some beautiful soul in this lane takes pity on me sees my blinker and thinks, oh, this must be a teenager who's only just learning to drive. I will let this poor soul in. And then they see that it's a fully grown adult male trying his best. More pity comes my way. <laughs> and I'm let it, like, so okay, I made a mistake and somebody was kind enough just to let, just that simple act of generosity. It puts me in a good mood, right? It makes me happy. It, gives, it makes me want to sort of pay it forward to somebody else, although normal people don't make dumb mistakes like that. Yeah, we do. But let me tell you a better story. Just something going on in my life right now that I'm so excited about that I think is so cool. So if you were here in, in July, we had a guest speaker come by the name of Steve Carter, and he was fantastic. If you missed his message, go back and listen to it. And when Steve was here, I asked him, I said, hey, can we record an episode of the Engaging Culture podcast while you're here? That's a podcast that normally uh, Pastor Lance and I do together. But when we have guests come through, I try to maybe grab them for a, for a quick kind of special episode sort of a thing. So he says, sure. So we make plans. After Saturday night church, we're going to go up in our studio and record an episode. And what I learned about Steve as I was learning about him prior to his visit was I learned that Steve is a huge sports nerd. I'm like, fantastic. We're going to get along great. We were talking about the NBA within two minutes of meeting each other. It was, great. it was wonderful. So I said, hey, Steve, let's record an episode talking about the intersection of faith and sports. Because I think you know, a lot of believers are sports fans. A lot of us are involved in sports in different ways. And I've just spent a lot of time just thinking through, okay, it's recreation and it's fun and how do we keep it from becoming too much and it can be all consuming and all this other stuff. Let's just do an hour talking about that. So we did. We had a great time. I came out of that hour thinking, I don't know if anybody else would ever want to listen to this, but I had a blast. But one of the things that Steve shared with me that was so cool was he talked about how when he used to coach his daughter's soccer team, that one year he did this, that he passed out cards to all of the parents at every game. And on those cards, there was a name of a player on the team. And the player was not their own child. And he, what he said to the parents was he said, your job during the course of this game is you're supposed to watch this kid and I want you to write something positive to them on this card. And as best as you can, I don't want it to be about their soccer skills. We want to affirm attitude and effort and sportsmanship and enthusiasm and things like that. So everybody wrote these cards and then he was able to share them with all the different kids on his team. And as we're discussing this on air on the podcast, I said, I am totally stealing that idea. And he said, do it. So 
I coach my eight-year-old's soccer team and I assistant coach with my six-year-old. So with our eight-year-old's team, when the season started, I talked to all our parents and I said, hey, I want to do this. And I explained it to them how it's all going to work. And, and I got a great group of parents on this team and, and that includes some of you. And, and they were in. In fact, so what we do is we do this before every game, every parent gets a card with the name of a kid on them. In fact, Ariana, who is just leading us in worship here, she's the card coordinator on my team. And it's been so cool to see, first of all, parents get their cards. And then I'm listening to them during the game as we're coaching. They're like, okay, who's our kid? Okay, Daniel. All right, hey, all right, go Daniel. And it's been so fun to see them cheer him on. But here's the, here's the better part of it. So I told you I was out of town this last weekend. I missed the game which I hate missing games. I just love being there. Hate it, hated to miss it. And I'd heard all about it from I'd FaceTimed with my son and talked to the different coaches and whatever. But we get to practice on Monday. And, and I get the kids together before practice starts. I was like, hey kids, tell me about the game. How did it go? And they're all excited. Oh, we won and we scored all these goals. And da, 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 da. They're all excited, right? And I said to them, I said, hey, um, just so you guys know, I don't know if you guys knew this, but uh, I've actually got people that are watching you. These kids are eight, remember that. And they start looking at each other like, wait, what? I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I've got, especially, like even when I'm here or when I'm not here, I've got people watching you and they're, they're writing down how you guys are doing out there. And they start looking at each other all nervous, like, oh boy, how's this going to go, right? And what was so cool is Ariana had taken all these cards and put them into a spreadsheet. So I had them right in front of me. I was able to pull them up on, my, on our phone, on my phone. And what, is I, what I did is we're in our little huddle. I went around to each kid and I was like, hey, Lucas, I heard that you did a really great job running after the ball and did a great job supporting your teammates. Hey, Matthew, that's my son. I heard that you were super aggressive and that you, did, you cheered on your teammates really well when they did well, you know? Hey, Aiden, I heard you were always right there in the mix, mix, mix of it and you, were, you hustled all game long. And this, is, this was the best. I got like eight or nine kids in and they're all smiling and everything else. And then I start asking them. Hey, Daniel, it says here, you know, da 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 da, da. Is that true? Yeah. Hey, Luke, I heard, is that true? Yeah. Not lacking in confidence, right? But it was so cool to see just their faces light up and how excited they were to see these positive words. We had the best, best practice of the year that night, right? And I immediately realized something. I'm like, I'm not wasting these at practice anymore. We're reading them before games from now on, right? We can beat anybody when these kids get this fired up. And the, but, what, but why? What, why? What's so powerful about that? It was, it was a bunch of parents, including some of you. You're on my team. It was, it was a bunch of parents being generous with their words, and the kids were transformed, right? And I can't wait till the end of the season when we get to get, give every kid a stack of cards saying, here's what the people that watched you thought about you this year, and just to speak life and to speak life and to speak life. I think it's transformative. If you're a coach, steal that idea. It's a really good one right? It's transformative. Generosity transforms us. That's how it works. That's how it works. And here's what we're also going to see as we look to the scriptures now, is that generosity is transformative, but that it's not meant to stop with us. That the generosity of God is not meant to stop with us. In fact, if you're following along with your handout or, or through the app, here, here's the fill in the blank. God wants us to use what he's given us. God wants us to use what he's given us. God has been generous, and generosity is transformative, and his generosity is not meant to stop with us. So here we go, Matthew chapter 20. Did I already tell you to open there? I didn't yet. Matthew chapter 20, page 825, if you're using a Bible underneath the seat in front of you. Here's our first story. Verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. A couple things here real quick. We're going to stop about every verse or so for the first about five verses, and then we'll kind of read the story. So it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a master. Now this story has a lot of characters and has a few different locations to it. But what is the kingdom of heaven like? The kingdom of heaven is like this character specifically. And what we learn is he's a master. He owns a vineyard. He's a landowner. And he needs day laborers. Day laborers existed in that culture just like they do in ours. And just like in our culture, in their culture, day laboring was not an easy profession. There's a lot of uncertainty in that world. There's not a lot of paid time off in that world. Not a lot of medical benefits, right? That what these individuals would have to do is they would wake up in the morning and they would leave their families. And they'd go to a predetermined location. And they would wait 
And they would hope and they would pray that somebody would need them that day, that there would be a job for them that day, that they would be able to, at the end of the day, go provide for their families. The stress of that life, the uncertainty of that life, the pressure of that life, the courage that it takes to have to stand out sort of in the middle of the street or on the street corner and just kind of broadcasting to the world, I'm unemployed and I need a job, right? That was sort of the life that these day laborers were experiencing. Verse two, but so far the story's pretty normal in the sense that this is something, again, it happens in our culture today and it happened back then. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into the vineyard. Now, a denarius is just, it's a day's wage. It was about enough money to buy food for your family for three to six days, depending on the size of the family. Nobody's getting rich working for a denarius a day, but it was enough to put food on the table and pay the bills. Verse three. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you go into my vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So he goes out after three hours, and he hires more people, which is a little bit odd. You would think he would have just hired all he needed to begin with. And then with these people, he doesn't even make a deal with them. He doesn't say, oh, I'll give you this amount of money. He just says, come with me, and I will treat you justly. I will do what is just. It it makes us think, perhaps this person had a reputation for treating employees fairly. Verse 5, so they went, going out again about the sixth hour, and about the ninth hour, he did the same. Okay, now it's just getting weird. Like, what is going on here? Why has now this master of the vineyard made four separate trips out into the marketplace to find workers? Like, is he new at this? Does he not understand how much work there is to be done? Is he, is he sort of a vineyard management rookie trying to figure this out? Well, there's, there's nothing in the story that leads us to believe that. Did, did he hire just lazy workers at the beginning and he's going, man, I need to find some workers that can actually get something done, right? Well, there's nothing in the story that leads us to believe that. But here's what most commentators believe is going on here. That we learn some interesting things about this master. First of all, that he's even the one going out into the marketplace would have been unique for that culture. We're going to learn later in the story that he had a foreman. He had someone who sort of managed his employees. It would have been far more kind of within normal custom to send the foreman out to get the laborers. But for whatever reason, the master goes out himself. And this is not about him not understanding how much work he needed or him not understanding uh, kind of the work level that each person could finish. But there was something else going on that, that most commentators believe what went on is he went out there in the morning and he knew he needed some laborers, about six in the morning, and he hired as many as he thought he could use. And he took them back to the vineyard and he put them to work. But then as he's leaving, he's looking back and he's thinking, man, there's still a lot of guys out there that need a job today. Ah, man, what am I gonna do? So what he does is he goes back out at nine in the morning and what he's hoping is he's hoping that all those guys are gone, meaning they all found work. But he goes back and, well, they're not gone. There's still a bunch there. So he hires as many as he thinks he can use. He said, all right, just just come with me and I'll find you. I'll find you something. I'm gonna take care of you. But then he's still thinking, man, there's still all these people back there that need work. Ah, what am I gonna do? So he waits until noon and he goes back. Surely by now, six hours, the day is gone. Surely by now, these people have all found work, but he goes back. He's hoping to see the street corner empty, but there's still people there, so he takes more. Three o'clock, same thing, still people out there, desperate for a job. He goes out there, he takes more. And we're even gonna see in the very next, very next verse, verse six, and about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you too, you you go into the vineyard too. The 11th hour, it's five o'clock in the evening. The day is over. He goes out, there are still people there trying to find a job. They're not looking for a handout. They're not looking for pity. They're saying, we want to work and no one will hire us. And he says, come on, come join me in my vineyard. Here's what was going on with the landowner. He recognized that he was a person of privilege. He recognized that he was a person of some means. And what he saw in his context was a bunch of people that did not have the same privilege and the same means that he had. 
And what he decided he wanted to do was he said, you know what, the gifts that I have been given, the resources that I have, they're not just for me. I want to seek to be as generous as possible and extend as much blessing as I can. So he goes out to these men and hires more. Did he hire more than he needed? Probably, almost certainly. He goes out to these men and he hires more. But what I love and what I find so inspiring about this story and about this character is that he wants to use the resources he has, he wants to use the privilege that he has to be a blessing who don't, to those who don't have those resources, a blessing who those, who, to those who don't share that privilege. And I just wonder, for so many of us, and I'm, 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 I'm so guilty of this, I get so locked into my routine, I get so locked into busy or whatever, got all my stuff to do, racing from place to place, that I'm not living my life with that mindset of, okay, God has given me resources, God has given me privilege, how might I use that to be a blessing to others? And I just think, how transformative could it be if you and I, we lived with the mindset of this landowner where, listen, his deal was he was a rich guy with lots of money. It doesn't have to be money. But you and I, we have resources and we have privilege in different ways. And what if we sought to go into our workplaces, into our schools, into the coffee shops we frequent, into our grocery stores, and sought to say, okay, who is there that needs some encouragement? Who, what are the resources I have that I can, my my resources, I can give someone some time. My my resources, I can share a kind word. My my resource or my privilege is that I've been so filled up by God's spirit that I can can be a blessing to others today. What if we lived with that mindset? Don't you think it would be transformative? What if we lived with the mentality of God has been so generous to me? Then in every place I go, now I have the opportunity to bring blessing. That's the heart of the landowner in this story, and I think it's really beautiful and really inspiring. So the story continues. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his his, his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Wait a second. These people showed up at five o'clock in the evening. They showed up at the very end of the day. And the landowner says, pay them first and pay them a whole day's wages. I don't think those guys walked out of there that day. I think they were skipping on their way home. They could hardly believe their good fortune, right? But as you can imagine, put yourself in the shoes of those who had worked the whole day. They're thinking, well, shoot, if these guys got a full day's pay, we got like at least a week's worth coming our way. They're getting, they've already spent the money in their minds as they're waiting in line, right? They're all excited. Verse 10. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour. And, have made them, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Do you not agree with me? Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my, de- my generosity? That word for begrudge literally means stingy. So the idea is, are you so stingy that you cannot appreciate my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. It's kind of a weird story, isn't it? But the landowner says, listen, I want to be as generous to as many people as possible. Like, this is a very different story if he gets to the end and the people that had worked all day, now all of a sudden he says, oh, well, I promised you a denarius, but I've given all my money to other people, so I only have half a denarius left for you, right? It's a different story. But he doesn't do that. He fulfills his obligation. He says, I I paid you what I told you I'd pay you. And then I used my generosity to be a blessing to more and more and more people. Did they work as hard as you did? No, they didn't, but that's not really the point. Because the point of my generosity is not who deserves it, but rather what opportunities do I have to be generous? See, that's the heart of God. And that's the heart with what's going on in the story. And the grumbling people at the beginning, what are they mad about? You have made these other people equal to us. 
right? They're so wrapped up in their own little world that they don't like the fact that the landowner has been generous. They don't like the fact that in the eyes of the landowner, they're all the same and they're all going to be blessed, which to me shows that they weren't all that concerned with the landowner's business to begin with, but they were only concerned with their own stuff. See, what's the principle here? There, there are a bunch, but I think one of the big ideas is that the kingdom of God is not about me getting the most. The kingdom of God is about everybody having enough. The kingdom of God is not about me getting the most, it's about everybody having enough. That when God lavishes out his grace, he extends it as far as wide as possible. That is there grace for the one who, you know, the old saying goes, born in church on a Friday, or born, born on a Friday in church on Sunday and never left? <laughs> is there grace for that person? You bet there is. Is there grace for the person who, who only comes to faith very, very late in life and has all sort of stuff behind them? Guess how much grace there is for that person? Enough. Just as much. Just as much. And see, when we're concerned only with God, how much are you blessing me? How much are you blessing me? Then we might look at God's blessings to those who we feel are less worthy of it, and we'll be like the laborers here saying, wait a second, God, I've done all this stuff for you. How come you're blessing them just as much or more than me? And God says, haven't I blessed you enough? Have I not been generous to you? C can you not be so transformed by my generosity towards you that you can celebrate the generosity I give to others, right? Is there an economic lesson in this parable? Of course there is, that those of us with, with means that we're invited to, to imitate God in the way we generously use our resources. Is there a social lesson in this? Of course there is, that those of us who have the resources to give time and kindness and our talents, that we might use those talents to bless others like the landowner used his. Is there a theological lesson to this? Yes, of course there is. I mean, even, even in the context of Gentiles coming to faith, the, the faith that had been sort of just a Jewish faith up to this point, that God is saying, listen, Jew and Gentile alike, Jews, I know you've been in the game for a really long time, and the Gentiles have only just shown up recently, but there's grace for everybody. <laughs> and that's really good news if your concern is for my kingdom. That's maybe not such good news if you're stuck focused on your own kingdom, Right? The message is that God is generous and that in God's kingdom there's enough for everybody and that's something for us to celebrate. But then as I stated at the beginning, this generosity is never meant to stop with us. We're supposed to do something with it. God who lavishes his grace upon us, God who has a denarius for everybody, he then says, okay, I want you to use it for something. I want you to use what I give you to be a blessing. And we're going to look at that now in the next parable we have to to study, and it's just a few pages over if you're following along, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14. God, who is so generous with us, says, I don't want you just to keep it for yourself. He says, I want you to, to, to live eyes open, arrows out, thinking about, okay, how can I take what I have been given and use it to be a blessing for others? And listen, there are a lot of you in this room who you live that way. God has done a work in your heart and it's just natural to you. That's just who you are. And if that's you, you know the joy of that. You know that a lifestyle of generosity is addicting. That once you start to be generous, you're like, man, this is so exciting. I want to do it more and more and more. And yet I also know that for a lot of us, being generous financially, being generous with our time, being generous with our words, just sort of even investing the mental energy to, to think about, okay, how can I care about people around me? That there are some of us who would say, gosh, in the midst of busyness and everything else, that's just really hard for me. Or, or I think about generosity, I, I think, about this, think about it this way way too often. That I think about, say, being generous financially, and I think, well, God, if I give a bunch of money away, is there going to be enough left for me? And God's like, you know I'm God, right? Like, if there's something you need, like, we'll be all right. God, if I spend all this time and sort of set my agenda aside and seek to care for other people, am I going to have time to do all the things that I want to do? God's like, you know I'm God, right? Like, how about, just throwing it out there, how about we focus on the things that I want you to do? That'll go for it. But there's some fear in that, right? And, and I get that. And it's funny, I think, about, I think about my kids, how I'm in this sort of funny season of life, and, and, and my guess is you probably relate to this if you're a parent, but I'm in this funny season of life where I'm constantly having to convince my kids that things are awesome. 
when they've never done them before, right? In fact, I've teased them in the past. I've said, you realize pretty much everything in your life that you like, you thought was gonna be terrible until you finally trusted me and tried it, right? So, so for example, this last week, there was significant effort put in to prepare my kids for a birthday party they went to on Friday night because this birthday party was going to involve laser tag, which was a new frontier for us. And both of my kids made it known, nope, not gonna happen, not playing. All right, here we go. So we're getting out some YouTube videos, watching, here's what laser tag is, it's not scary, no, the lasers are not gonna incinerate you, like, it doesn't hurt, like, you know, your gun stops working for a few seconds if you get shot, but how long, how do I know it works again? Like, okay, we're going through all this, right? Helping them see it's fun, it's not scary, it's pretend and all that. So we get to the birthday party on Friday, and we're having a good time playing, eating pizza, whatever, and it comes time for laser tag, and they walk in, and there are some tears from my youngest as we walk into the room, but they make it. I assure them, hey, I'll be in there with you, this, that, and the other thing. So the game starts, and the kids start running around, and what do you think happened? They had a great time. And what are they saying as we're walking out into the parking lot? When can we come back to this magical place again, right? And I was teasing him in the car, fully knowing that an eight-year-old and a six-year-old are not going to get, like, what I was trying to say to him. But I said, you know, guys, uh, you could just believe me when I tell you that something's going to be fun. Because it's going to be. And it is pretty much every time, right? But I know that's not going to happen. And I also know, I don't look at my kids and go, where did this attitude come from? I'll tell you where it came from. I tortured my dad in the same way, right? But I think in a similar way with God. Be like, God is telling us again and again, listen, when you live eyes open, arrows out, seeking to be generous, seeking to use the gifts that I've given to you for the sake of others, there is blessing in that. There is joy in that. There is purpose in that. There is fulfillment in that that goes so far beyond a life set, spent fixated on your narrow self-interests, right? God says, your generosity, my generosity is not meant to stop with you. It's meant to be shared. So with that, here we go. This parable is called the parable of the talents. Chapter 25, starting in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Okay, a few things we need to get straight here as we, as we set up the story and then we're gonna kind of get into it. Number one, a talent is a lot of money. Like a lot, a lot of money. We're talking 2019 equivalent, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Multiple talents, we're getting into the millions of dollars at this point. So this is not, hey, here, can you, I've got 20 bucks here, can you hang on to it for me for a little bit? This is a lot of money. And in this story, the man going on the journey is the God character, and then we're the servants, people who would call ourselves his people. And it says this, it says that he gives to each according to his ability. Understand, God entrusts us with responsibility in accordance to our ability. Or or an easier way to say that, God entrusts us with responsibility on the basis of our ability. That God gives each one of us different levels of ability. Some of us are five talent people. Some of us are two talent people. Some of us are one talent people. Some of us are point one talent people. Pastor Lance, obviously a 10 talent person. Pastor Parnell, 15. You know, like we all know this, right? God gives us talents differently. And by uh, talent, a metaphor, money, meaning abilities, right? Or he gives us ability, he gives us talents based on our ability. He gives us talent based on our ability. And it's not for us to decide our abilities, right? Like God is the one who determines who has what abilities. I mean, you realize that you had no more say over your IQ than you did over your height, right? You're not like, I'd like to be 6'3 and a 180, please. Like, you didn't get to pick that, right? So it's not for us to take pride in our ability. Hey, look at me. I'm a five-talent person. Because look at me. Let me make something real clear to you right now. God loves you a whole bunch, but he's not impressed by you. (laughs) I 
can't tell if that's grumbling or laughing. <laughs> that was laughing. God loves you a whole bunch, but he's not impressed by you. He's not like, wow, you are gift. Holy cow. How did you, I'm so glad you're on my team. How did you ever become so gifted? Oh, that's right. Literally everything you have is a gift from me. <laughs> God is the one who gives our ability. So that's not for us, for us to take pride in. It's for us to recognize it is a wonderful stewardship God has given us. And if we feel like we're less gifted, that's not for us to begrudge. It's not for us to, oh, well, God only made me a one-talent person. You're a one-talent person for the glory of God, right? It's not for us to begrudge, oh, these other people seem more gifted. Oh, these other people seem like they have a better situation. Oh, they're smarter. Oh, they make more money. Oh, they have a better job. Listen, that's not for us. Because that was never for us to decide. And listen, when we waste our lives being envious of those we perceive as being more gifted than we are, listen, we think that our issue is with them, but it's not. Who's our issue with? God. Because God's the one who passed out the abilities to begin with. Can we develop our abilities? Of course we can. But on some level, God passes out our abilities. And then he gives us responsibilities that match up with those abilities, it's not for us to decide, right? And then here's the other thing, is that God invites us into responsibilities that make sense for our skills and for our gifting. Like something that I see and I hear about in the business world that I've always thought is a little bit funny to me, is like take, I mean, take someone who's great in sales, pick your industry, but take someone who's really great in sales. And if they're great in sales year after year, they're blowing through quotas, they're hitting numbers, they're leading departments you know, in terms of numbers and blah, 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 they're so great at sales. What do companies tend to do with somebody who is a great salesman, great saleswoman for years and years and years? They make them the sales manager. So now they're not selling anymore. It's a promotion, I guess. They're not selling anymore. And now they're doing this job that has a totally different skill set than the thing that they're good at, right? Never mind the fact that there's tons of research that shows that highly competent people tend to not make very good teachers because there's some intuition involved in high competence and that's very hard to teach. How are you a great salesperson? I, I don't know, I just go sell stuff. Oh, that's helpful, let me write that down, right? Not helpful. Or, you know, therapy world or different nonprofit worlds. Oh, someone's a great therapist for years and years, so now we make them the therapy manager where they're not seeing clients, they're not bringing blessing that way. Instead, they're frustrated because they don't get to do what they love and they're trying to figure out a totally different job. Listen, God is not going to promote you out of your competence and into incompetence. God gives you responsibilities that match with your abilities. God gives to each according to their ability. And, and, and here's... here's Here's what I need you to know. And, and then we're going to move on and look at the story. <clears throat> what level talent person are you? I don't know. And I don't really care. Because that's up to God, not up to us. But here's what I know to be true. I don't have to know anything else about you to know that this is true. That if you're a follower of Jesus, you have something to offer in God's kingdom. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have, if you're not a follower of Jesus, become a follower of Jesus. And you've got something to offer in God's kingdom too. You've got something to offer. You've got something to offer. 1 Corinthians 12 says, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It is not just the leaders who have something to offer. It is not just the people that are on stage with a microphone on their face that have something to offer. It's not just the pastors and the missionaries who have something to offer. I need you to know, you, 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 yes, the person sitting next to you too, but also you, you have something to offer in God's kingdom. You are gifted to participate in God's work in the world. And I think it is such a tragedy in the church today. So many of us, we fall asleep to that reality and I think there are men and women in this room today you need to be awakened to your own potential you need to be awakened to the reality that God has gifted you and that you buried in your heart is the ability to bring blessing to those around you and what I think is so sad is so often we'll just, we, we end up getting, playing these little games with ourselves. I do the same thing where we're just like, uh, I'm just little old me. I don't have anything to offer. Only that person who is better and more famous and handsomer and a better speaker and da, 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 knows the Bible more. They have something to offer. I'm just little old me. Listen, don't get it twisted. The kingdom of God is about little old me's who serve a great God and are empowered by him to do great things. Right? 
you have something to offer. You have something to offer. God did not overlook you when he was passing out gifting. You're a part of the family, and you get to participate in the family business. All right, I gotta go. We're almost out of time. Here we go. Verse 17, sorry, verse 16. He would receive the five talents, went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also, he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid the master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I made the five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also had... He, and he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. A couple things here. Number one, both of these people, the five-talent person and the two-talent person, take what God gave them, and they produce with it. And they come back, or they give what the master gave them. They come back, and what does the master say? Note he does not say to the two-talent person, wow, I am two-fifths as happy with you as I am with the five-talent person. He says, well done. See, our call is to take what God gave us, to seek to invest it for his glory. He's the one who produces the fruit anyway. And God is not ranking us on how much fruit we can produce. What he's saying is, are you willing to take what I give you and invest it for my glory? Second thing, Notice that the reward is not, oh, you've done what I've asked, and now I have no longer have any use for you. He says, you've been faithful over a little, now I will make you faithful over more. Which, two things with that. Number one, if you want to be faithful over more, you have got to start with being faithful over little. Too many of us want the stewardship of more, but we're not willing to be faithful with little. Every person who ever steps on this stage, it starts with being faithful with little. That's where it has to start, right? If you want to be faithful with more, you got to be faithful with little. But then also, he doesn't say again, he doesn't say, I have no more use to, for you. He says, I have something else for you to do. And I just super quick want to say this to, to those of you that are in, we'll call it the generation above me and above that. We need you really, really bad. My generation needs you really, really bad. You might, if I may be so bold, you might retire from paid employment. Please don't retire from service in the kingdom of God. We need you. My gener those of us like me who don't have a ton of experience with people old, of a generation above mine who, who've invested spiritually and taught me how to, how to you know, follow Jesus and all of that, there are people like me and people below. We need you. We desperately need you. Don't believe the lie that you don't have anything left to offer. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Please, please, please stay in the game. Find your place. We need you so badly. And then the last thing I want to show you is this. Is that what does he say? Enter into the joy of your, their, of your master, right? What happens when you and I, when we find our gifts, when we use our gifts, when, we're act, when they're activated and we're able to glorify God with our gifts, what happens? There is joy, right? I mean, who benefits most? Who benefits most when you discover your gifts and begin to use them for God's glory, to serve others, to bless others, to be a part of God's work? Who benefits most? You. You benefit most. We had a great conversation about this in my missional community on Thursday night where a guy in our group serving in, who serves in prison ministry, a buddy of mine, he said, man, when I go and serve, I know I'm blessed more than those guys ever could be, right? See, when you activate your gifts, you are blessed, and then you're a blessing. There's joy in that. Now, how does the story end? Admittedly, not great. Verse 24. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. 
You knew that I reaped where I had not sown and gathered where I had scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, everyone who has will, be give, will more be given, and he, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Is this story meant to make us paranoid? (laughs) No, it's not. And we don't have time to get into it, but the bottom line is, with this guy, he had the master all wrong. And even in the master's response, if we had time, I could explain to you how the master's response is basically calling him out, saying, you say you thought all these things about me, but it's just not true, and you know it's not true, right? One talent person took himself out of the game because he didn't want to use what he'd been given. And I think too many of us, we see what we have, we don't feel like it's enough, so we take ourselves out of the game. So we're deprived of the blessing of using the talent God has given us for his glory. Or we're afraid of screwing it up, so we bury our talent and say, okay God, your talent is safe here, but at least I know I'm not going to mess up with it. And God's saying, I'm God, I'm generous, I have more talents, go, use it. If you screw it up, it's okay, there's grace for you, we'll find something else for you to do. But this guy took himself out of the game. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. So here's the application. If Bridgeway is your church family, I have two things for you. If Bridgeway is your church family, and you have not yet found your place, this is a no guilt, no manipulation announcement. I want to encourage you to find your place. The only thing, your only regret once you do is you wish you'd found it sooner. We're a family, and we want to be about God's business together. Go out, see some of the men and women out there. Find your place. And I promise you as you go out there, no sales pitches. This isn't like the mall where you're like walking through the kiosks going, don't make eye contact. Right? <laughs> it's just men and women who want to help you find your place. And then if I can just encourage you, I never want to just say, we talk about serving God's kingdom, that I hope you'll do that here, but it can't stop here. I just want to encourage you, whatever you're doing out there in the world, in your workplace, whether you're you're, you're a stay-at-home parent, whether you're volunteering in different places, whether you're retired, whether you're a student, I need you, if you have not made this shift in your mind already, I need you to recognize that any work that is done for the glory of God is kingdom work that you can glorify God in whatever it is that you do, that you can take God's generosity that he has given you and you can then be a blessing wherever God takes you. It bums me out so much when I hear people say things like, well, uh, there are like the holy jobs, like being a pastor or a missionary, and then there's just little old you know, jobs like mine that don't matter. That is not true. <laughs> All work is kingdom work when it's done for the glory of God. And when that mindset is shifted, I think it can infuse your life with purpose like you've never seen before. You can recognize every bit of work is holy work. Every day on your job that seems so disconnected from whatever else, there is opportunity in that for you to build God's kingdom. There's opportunity for you to be a blessing. There's opportunity for you to glorify God by doing your job well, all of it. So I'm gonna pray and we're gonna head on out there Our kids are in program until 12.30. So I want to encourage you, don't go get them until 12.30. They're having snack time anyway. They will not be happy if you go get them. But it is not a hostage situation. If you need your kids, it's fine. We'll give them to you. But, but just want to encourage you, take 10 minutes, go on out there, look around, have some conversations. And if you're just in a position today where you're like, I can't do this. I just don't have, for whatever reason, I cannot sign up to serve. This is just not my thing at this time. Listen, even if that's, in your, that's your place, still don't get your kids. Just enjoy 10 kid-free minutes on us, okay? I uh, want to invite the prayer team to come on up. If you've got anything, you walked in here today where you need prayer for anything at all, come see them before you head on out there. But let me pray for you, and then you'll be dismissed. God, thank you that you're generous. Thank you that you have gifted us in so many different ways. And I just want to pray for my brothers and sisters here today. That for any of us who have fallen asleep to our own potential. For any of us that have started to take for granted the gifts that you've given us and have been led to believe that maybe our gifts aren't that great. That you would help us to recognize that indeed we have something to offer. Would you help us to be awakened to our own potential? 
Would you help us to see that we can serve you and that we can be a part of your work in the world and there's great joy in that. I pray for those who are gonna take a step today and sign up to serve, to get involved, to start to connect in that manner. God, I pray your blessing over them as they serve. God, I pray for those who, for whatever reason, and they know their reasons that just now's not the time and they can't do it and it's just not gonna work for them. God, I, I don't want even a hint of guilt over them. But God, for those of us who would take that step, I pray that you would bless those who serve. I pray that you would give each one of us the joy of seeing you work with us, work through us for your glory, to bless others, to bring glory to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you out there.